And point number nine says the harlot and the rulers of Judea committed fornication. The harlot and the rulers of Judea committed fornication or that spiritual fornication, right? Our text there are Revelation 17, 2, Acts 4, 26 and 27, Isaiah 1, 20, 1 to 23, Ezekiel 16, 1 to 5, 8, 12 to 16, 38 to 41. All right. So the harlot and the rulers of Judea committed fornication. All right. Revelation 17, verse 2. Let's go there and see what that says. Go to our Bible. It says there, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk. Okay, so let's stick with this one. With whom the kings, or remember we said, these are the rulers of the land. They have committed fornication together with her. Remember the context of the book of Revelation. The things, the events, the characters were in John's time, were in the apostles' time. And the things which were about to happen were to, about to happen in John's time, in the apostles' time, okay? So as I, was, as I said previously, the kings of the earth are really the rulers of the land, that is the holy land in the time of John. Judea, okay, the Bible is concerned about, the land that the Bible is concerned about is the Holy Land. And so, the ruling authorities in the land of Judea, both Israelite and Roman, both Jew and Gentile, Jerusalem as a covenant people were frequently led into idolatry and covenant breaking by the rulers of the land as well as the Gentile leaders who were also ruling in that land. Like, for example, the Roman governors who were responsible for Jer Jerusalem and Judea. Okay? Now, in the case of the time of John and the ministry of the apostles, which the Revelation is referring to, Jerusalem's Israelite leaders colluded and collaborated with the Roman leaders in the crucifixion of Christ and the persecution and the martyrdom of Christ's ministers. You remember <clears throat> the, the high priests in the time of Christ at his crucifixion. They organized it so that it would seem as if one, uh, Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, had betrayed him and that they had found Jesus to be uh, um, breaking the, the law of sedition, which is a Roman law, okay, because they couldn't find anything where he had broken the Jewish law. So they sent him over to Pilate and said he, he, he is a seditionist, wanting to usurp Caesar then. And they even went as far as saying, we have no king but Caesar, right? So they wanted to use Pilate, present Jesus to Pilate on a trumped-up charge so that Pilate will have to carry out the, sen the Roman sentence against Jesus, which he was forced to do because he said, look, I don't find this man to be guilty. And they said, crucify him. And so Pilate being... Um, the, most of Roman governors wanted to keep the peace of Rome because at that time, Rome, the Roman Empire was at peace. And so to keep the peace, he gave in to the crowd. And that is how Jesus was crucified, right? And the, the Jewish leaders felt, oh, well, we didn't crucify him. It was Rome who crucified him. But according to God, on the day of Pentecost, Peter speaking full of the Holy Spirit said, you, you, Men of, of Israel have crucified, you have killed the author of life. So according to God, it was Jerusalem who had killed Jesus. Jesus himself had said he would be killed in Jerusalem, okay, because he was a prophet. 
So anyway, <laughs> so there was a collaboration between the kings of the earth, the kings of the holy land, the rulers of the land, in crucifying Christ and in the persecution and martyrdom of Christ's ministers, his apostles and prophets, right? So let's see how the apostles understood this phrase, kings of the earth, okay? Because many people, including myself, were told that the kings of the earth means the present modern day leaders of different nations like um, Joe Biden and uh, Vladimir Putin and etc. Okay, um, President Xi of China and Kim Jong Un of North Korea. According to the modern understanding, these are the kings of the earth. But Revelation was not talking about <laughs> the modern nations. Revelation was talking about the Holy Land, which was at the time of the apostles. That was the earth, the gay of the, of the book of, Re of, of which God was concerned. Okay, The Holy Land, Judea. Right? And we will see that that was the understanding the apostles had, which is, it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> right? You, we, have to, we have to see how did the apostles, who are God's anointed and appointed messengers and interpreters of Scripture, they had the authority to say what this thing meant. Good? So I rather take their... Um, interpretation than anybody else who go, who went to get doctors of divinity and masters in theology. If you ain't line up with what the apostles say, then I really don't have any respect <laughs> for such people, right? So the kings of the earth, let's see in Acts chapter 4, verse 26 and 27, right? The kings of the earth. How did the apostles understand the kings of the earth. Because once we get their understanding, that should settle it. Now, if we go just jump up to verse 25 here, okay, we have the apostol apostolic church praying. And they are praying and they are using Psalm chapter 2, right? They are quoting Psalm chapter 2 and they are understanding Psalm chapter 2 as being fulfilled based on what they had, what Christ and his disciples and his apostles were, were experienced or had experienced. Okay? So it says there, Who by the mouth of your servant David said, Quote, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? This is a direct quote of Psalm chapter 2. Well, the second Psalm, right? The kings of the earth stood up. Here's that phrase. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his Christ. For a truth. Now, so they, they quoted the second Psalm verses 1 and 2. And then they now give their understanding of the kings of the earth. It says, For of a truth against your holy child Jesus, whom you have anointed, both Herod, now Herod was an Israelite king of Judea, the holy land, and Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was a Roman governor of Judea, the holy land with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Gathered together how? Against your holy child, Jesus. So you see who the kings of the earth <laughs> in the understanding and in the interpretation of the apostles, the kings of the earth were the leaders of Judea. You had Herod. He was an Israelite king. And his dominion was Judea. You had Pontius Pilate. He was a Roman governor. And his jurisdiction was Judea. <laughs> right? Pontius Pilate was not a king over the whole globe. He was just assigned to Judea. 
King Herod was not the king of the entire planet. He was just the king over Judea. So the kings of the earth is more correctly translated the kings or the rulers of the holy land. Okay? Now, the kings of the land, now the kings of the holy land or the rulers of the holy land historically committed fornication with Jerusalem. Historically, spiritual fornication was always committed in the form of covenant abomination such as idol worship the leaders of Jerusalem were the ones who went you even look at Solomon for example Solomon who was supposed to be the wisest man and the wisest king his wives which he married from the waters the surrounding nations <laughs> they influenced him to commit spiritual fornication by going into adopting the religious practices of their um, homeland where, where his wives came from, these foreign nations, right? <laughs> and so Solomon was a king of the land. Okay? King of the land. So let's look at um so 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 these leaders influence the people of Jerusalem to adopt idol worship, covenant ab abomination, adopt religious practices of the surrounding nations, covenant abomination. These are spiritual fornication they are committing. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 1 verse 21 to 23, right? Isaiah two, chapter 1, 21. Right? We're looking at how these kings of the earth, along with Jerusalem, committed spiritual fornication. Right? What was the abominations that they did? Look at what God said there. Verse 21. How is the faithful city? What faithful city is that? <laughs> Jerusalem. How the faithful city became... How is the fit, faithful city become what? An harlot. A city being a harlot, Jerusalem being a harlot, it was nothing new. <laughs> All Revelation was doing now is pulling from the old established symbolism, the old established spiritual language, and using it now to describe the condition of Jerusalem in the time of the apostles. <laughs> it was even using events that had already happened in the time of the, of the first temple and using those events now to describe what would happen to Jerusalem of the second temple in John's time, right? And we'll see that. So anyway, it says, How is the faithful city become an harlot? It, is, it was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. It used to be a, a city that had judgment, in other words, correct thinking. But, and, and righteousness lived there. But now murderers lived there. And that was in the time of Isaiah. That was in the time of, the, of Solomon's temple, the first temple period, right? Jerusalem during the first temple period was called an harlot. And why? It says your silver is become dross, your wine mixed with water, your princes, this is the leaders of the land, are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves gifts and follows after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither does the cause of the widow come to them. So you see, again, the leaders of the land, these are the, the princes the leaders of Judea. They were the cause of Jerusalem be being called a harlot. Again, the history of Jerusalem's harlotry, her covenant abominations, reads like a tragic love story. <laughs> if you go to Ezekiel 16, right? Ezekiel 16, let's look at that. Again, these are some interesting passages that you can read. In your leisure and pleasure. 
it, let's read verse 1 to 5. We can't read the entire thing, so we'll skip out. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, came to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, right? And say, thus says, thus said the Lord God to Jerusalem, okay? Your birth and your nativity is of the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother an Hittite. So he, God is showing the, tracing the, the history of Jerusalem, showing that it came from not uh, noble origins, right? It says, and as for your nativity or your birth, in the day you were born, your navel was not cut. Neither were you washed in water to supple you. You were not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied you to do any of these to you, to have compassion on you, but you were cast out in the open field to the loading of your person in the, in the day that you were born. Okay? So God is painting this picture of Jerusalem as an outcast child. Right? And in verse 8, it says, Now when I passed by you and looked on you, Behold, your time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore to you and entered into a covenant with you. Okay, so now we're talking about Mount Sinai. We are talking about the Sinai covenant, the covenant concerning the Ten Commandments, the Torah, and all the laws, the precepts, the judgments, the sacrifices, the ordinances, the service of the temple, all of that. The, the, the Torah and the prophets, God made that covenant with Israel. A nobody, so to speak, right? He said the Lord, and you became mine. Good? You became mine. Let's jump down to verse 12 because we, we skip in for time. And I put a jewel on your forehead and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus, you, thus were you decked with gold and silver, and your raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work, and you did eat fine flour and honey and oil, and you were exceeding beautiful, and you did prosper into a kingdom. So God is showing, look, I took you from nothing and made you, to, made you into something, right? It was all because of what I did for you, all right? Let's continue. And your rena renown went forth among the heathen for your beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness which I had put on you. So whatever uh, beauty that Jerusalem had was as a result of the presence of the Lord there and the wisdom of, lo of the Lord in the laws that God had given to Israel and the, the ceremonies and so on, which were very, the, the, the ceremonies of the high priest and so on, it was, was very majestic. The temple, man, it was outstanding. Good? Yeah, and so people actually desired um, the Jewish way, but in but ironically, the Jews desired the heathen practices. <laughs> so that is why we said she was sitting on the waters, being influenced by the waters and influencing the waters. Right? Anyway, so but you but you did trust in your own beauty and played the harlot because of your renown and poured out your fornications on everyone that passed by. His it was. And of your garments you did take and decked your high places. So the, the high places are these false um, shrines or these shrines to false gods or idols, right? He took the, 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 the garments from the temple <laughs> and put them on these um, shrines. Decked your high place with diverse colors and play the harlot. Thereupon, the light thing shall not come, neither shall it be. So, let's jump down to verse 38 now. Okay, you can read the entire thing. It says, and I will judge you. Now remember, this is um, the first temple period. This was, the, this was Solomon's temple. And Isaiah was speaking, um, Ezekiel, sorry, here was speaking against Solomon's temple. He says, I will judge you. I will judge you as women that break wedlock. <laughs> okay? 
and shed blood are judged. So notice this, this, this wife of God who he had found and raised and gave her all her jewelry and everything like that and fed her and so on and made her into a queen. She turned around and committed harlotry. Good. And then God said, I will judge you as a woman that break wedlock. Okay. She, she broke the marriage covenant just like the harlot in Revelation 17. So you see, the harlot in Revelation 17 is pulling from this experience of the first temple Jerusalem. It says, And uh, I will give you blood in fury and jealousy. I will give you into their hand, that's the hand of your lovers, and they shall throw down your eminent place and shall break down your high places. They shall strip you also of your clothes and shall take your fair jewels and leave you naked and bare. Okay? And uh, verse 40 says, They shall also bring up a company against you and they shall stone you with stones. So here, here is where an army, and I believe this would be Nebuchadnezzar's army. This is the... The, the Babylon, the army of Babylon, the Chaldeans would come up against you. They shall stone you with stones and trust you through with their swords and they shall burn your houses with fire. Yes, this is what happened um, when um, Nebuchadnezzar came up, right? They destroyed Jerusalem. They burnt down the temple. They burnt down the, the palaces with fire and execute judgment on you in the sight of many women and I will cause you to cease from playing the harlot. And you shall give no more hire. You shall give no hire anymore, right? So this is what happened to the first temple, Solomon's temple. Then after the 70 years, they rebuilt the second temple, which would be Zerubbabel's temple, which was standing in the time of Christ and in the time of the apostles. And that temple, the leaders again, had begun to, well, had not begun, they had rejected the Son of God, which was the ultimate abomination, right? They had rejected the Son of God. That's the ultimate abomination. And they had sought to eradicate the preaching of the gospel, <laughs> right? So what Ezekiel is talking about here occurred 600 years before Christ, okay? When, 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 as a result of Jerusalem's abominations, as a result of Jerusalem's fornication, God allowed Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon to come up and destroy the temple, destroy the city, and take them captive into Babylon. That was 600 years before Christ. So Revelation 17 now is pulling from that as an example of what would happen to the second temple, Zerubbabel's temple, right? Because of the abominations that they, in John's time, were committing. And as I said, the main abomination was the rejection of the Son of God and the rejection of the gospel. Very powerful individuals called the leaders of the land or the kings of the earth, according to your mainstream Bible, had arisen within Jerusalem and their motives were very antagonistic to what God wanted to bring about in that region of the earth, namely the kingdom of heaven. So these people, these kings of the land or these rulers of, the, of Judea, they were earth focused. They didn't concern about kingdom of heaven. They wanted kingdom on the earth and, and political kingdom. Right? Remember Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. As a matter of fact, my kingdom is within. <laughs> That's what Jesus told them. So they weren't in interested in that because they could not govern people who had kingdom within. <laughs> right? They couldn't govern people who did, who did not um, come to them for authority because the authority of the kingdom of heaven is Christ and Christ dwells within. Right? They're self-governed. They didn't want that. So they wanted to continue with the present system of things which they could easily exploit and ascend into political power over the masses. And for this reason, they convinced Israel to reject the gospel. 
and they convince Israel to eradicate the preachers of the gospel, the, 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 the disciples, the apostles, and the, the prophets of Jesus because it did not align with their aspirations of a political kingdom. 